So I'm out again today for a hike through the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes Wilderness Area and I'm at that spot I've been going to quite a bit lately, the one down by the lake. You can probably see the water behind me. And uh, you know, it's just an absolutely gorgeous day. A little bit cool, a little bit windy. Hopefully that'll keep some of the flies away because the black flies have arrived and I've had to put on quite a bit of bug repellent. They'll get a lot worse than they are right now. So I'm gonna take advantage of another good day without too many flies. It's lunchtime, actually it's past lunchtime. And what I think I'll do is I'll sit down and make some lunch and I'm gonna try something that I've had at home but I've not done in the woods. Whether you're not, you've heard of this, it's called shakshuka. If you're interested in learning more about shakshuka, stay with me. Okay, quickly, before I get down to making the lunch, I just want to give you a little bit of a backstory on this. So this is only the second time I've actually cooked shakshuka for myself. The first time was at home. And the backstory is, it was one of those coincidences. I, in the morning, one morning in the newspaper, I came across a section that showed with a recipe that somebody was sharing about shakshuka. And I thought, that's interesting. That's something I hadn't seen before. I might give that myself a try. Well, that very same day, a friend of mine made a YouTube video where she made shakshuka at her kitchen at home and her name is Karen and her YouTube channel is Mama Bear's Backpack so shout out to Karen who showed me how to make shakshuka so combine that with the article that I read in the newspaper and that prompted me to give it a try and I'm I ever glad I did it is a wonderful dish that involves basically eggs cooked in tomato and a number of other things inside a little pan if that sounds interesting I'm you well you'll see in a second so let's get the camera repositioned I got to get my charcoal going and then we'll get to cooking Okay, so before I start putting the ingredients or show you the ingredients for the dinner itself, I just quickly want to show you what I'm going to be using for my cooking surface today. So again, I'm going to be using charcoal because of course we're still under a fire ban. I am able to use the charcoal, so that's what I'm going to use. This is going to be, so my whole theme today has been, I looked around and said, what do I have that I, I either purchased secondhand or something I modified from a secondhand from the thrift shop, something that I can do on the cheap. So that's what I did today is I brought out one of these pasta strainers. This is a smaller one. It's about nine inches in diameter. Little pasta strainer that I picked up. I've used it a few times for having fires in and it's working very well. And I've used it for using as a small charcoal burner. So that's what I'm going to use today. And once I get going, I'll show you what else I'm using because it's all either secondhand stuff or very inexpensive. Pretty much everything that I have anyway. So I'm going to get this lit with charcoal and get that going. And once that's just about ready for cooking on, that's when I'll bring you back and show you the ingredients. Okay, so my charcoal is just about ready and I'll show you that in a second what I'm using. But I just wanted to go over the ingredients and talk a little bit about shakshuka. So shakshuka is a wonderful Middle Eastern dish originated in the Middle Eastern North African area and is very popular even to today. And it has some very, very simple ingredients. So what I'm going to be using in mine is a combination of onions, garlic, green pepper, red pepper. Whew, the smell of that is strong. I cut this up this morning and boy, the, the smells inside of that are, are combining nicely. I just decided to save a little time rather than cut it all up out here. So you could get away with some very minimal stuff. I think probably the minimal you could go is an onion, some garlic, and then the next ingredient, which is tomatoes. Now you can either use fresh tomatoes chopped up and, and uh, stew them down from there, or you can do what I've done, which is to bring out some already canned stewed tomatoes tomatoes and these have a little bit of spices in them so that's just going to make it a little easier when I go to put this dish together save a little bit of time because it won't have to stew down quite as far and the third ingredient eggs and I know that sounds very different but that's all it is so basically what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, render these down a little bit so they soften up and get that nice translucent color to them. I'm then going to be adding the tomatoes in with it. And when that's stewed a little bit of time, I'm going to make a couple of spots. You'll see as I, what I mean by that. A couple of spots, or a couple of wells in the tomato. I'm going to crack some eggs in it. So basically, I'm poaching eggs in tomatoes. That's basically what it is. So, uh, you know, what spices? I do have some spices that I'm going to share with you in a second. As soon as I can find them. Where did they go? Right, so I've already uh, mixed my spices together, but the spices traditionally used in this, my understanding is that uh, paprika, smoked paprika, if you can get it, cumin, and some cayenne. So what I have is some cumin 
and some paprika, regular paprika, but I had some chipotle, which will add the smoke flavor. So how much? Well, this is what's interesting about this dish. There's no one way to cook it. Really, I think every cook has the opportunity to change it around and add it and make a few different things with it. Uh, you know, I had green peppers and uh, red peppers to mine. You don't have to, but you may want to add something else as well. You could start with fresh tomatoes or canned tomatoes. You could add other vegetables to it as well. You can add whatever spices and whatever quantities you want. The whole concept is just to poach a couple of eggs in the tomatoes mixed in with those other vegetables. Now to do that, I brought along something that I picked up at Value Village. And I'll tell you, these were separate when I bought them and they were in quite rough shape. So I have a lid. There's my cook kit for later. Uh, this was a mess. To be quite honest, it's just a little tiny, I don't know what you call it. It's almost like a small Dutch oven. And uh, I picked this up for a couple of dollars and I cleaned up the inside and polished it up a little bit. So that's what I'm going to be using to cook on. Only reason I didn't bring something else like a small carbon steel pan or the pan that I used the last time I was out is I just wanted to, well, we'll just show you this and what you can find for very inexpensive that will work. And also the size. The size is just perfect for what I want to do with it. So what I'm going to do now is reposition the camera. I'll put this on, start to get it heated up. I'll add the olive oil and I'll add the vegetables and we'll go from there. All right, so a lot of the cooking I'm going to be doing, I'm going to have to use gloves for. So what I've done is the grate that I put across the top of the pasta strainer is one of those inexpensive dollar store grilling baskets that I took the top off and turned it into a nice grate for grilling steak, hot dogs, whatever on. But it's also working today for a pot support. It's just this seems to be the best size pot support that I could find to go with this little pasture trainer right now until I find something else. It's working perfectly. It's got the uh, pot suspended above the charcoal just at the right height, I do believe. Well, we'll find out in a minute, I guess. So when you do this, you most of the cooking is done at a medium-high heat. You don't want to get it so hot that you burn things, but you want it to move along quite quickly, so a medium-high heat. Once I put the tomatoes in, normally you would turn it down and uh, stew it a little bit. So I'm not quite sure how I'm going to manage that. I think I'll just, if I keep things moving and keep my eye on it, then uh, I should be able to keep it from burning. But of course, uh, you know, working with a steady heat like the charcoal I have here, it's going to be a little bit difficult. So what's the first step? So the pan is getting nice and hot. I'm going to add olive oil. Uh, don't be stingy with the olive oil. It does not hurt it at all to have a good amount of olive oil in there. So probably three tablespoons it looks like. And I can see already it's starting to heat up very quickly. Get my vegetables in. Oh, listen to that sizzle. Oh, the smell. Yeah, this is quite hot, so looks like I am going to have to keep things moving quickly here. Looking good. The smell is just wonderful. So don't let things burn, but do keep them moving fairly quickly. So this is going to take a minute or two to bring it down to a nice translucent state. So what I'll do is, when it's time to add the tomatoes in, then I'll bring it back and we'll go from there. Alright, hopefully you can see I don't block my light. The vegetables are, or the onion, the green pepper, red pepper, garlic are all sautéed, turning golden brown. A little hot. I don't want it to get any browner than that. So just before I add the tomatoes, time to add my spices. Let this give the spices a stir, a little chance to mix in. That's quite a bit. I think I'll stop there. Get my glove back. Ooh, the smell. Between the paprika and the cumin. And the chipotle. <laughs> I'm getting that in the eyes now. Look at that. Look at the colors. Yeah, time to get the tomatoes in. Oh. Mix those through. Now I add it. Well, this is what was difficult for, for me. This is about a cup and a half of tomatoes. I had opened the can up, maybe even a little bit more than a cup and a half of tomatoes with those other things that I already had in there. 
So what's the right amount? I think it's going to be personal preference what you want to use. Uh, this looks like a good size meal. Uh, I Normally, uh, traditionally I guess, this is served with a piece of bread on the side of the plate because of course you're going to have quite a bit of juice when this is all said and done and the bread is used to sop that up and uh, you know get all that flavor so it doesn't go to waste. Uh, I could I guess also put it on rice or quinoa or something like that or even noodles I don't think that'd be too traditional but if you wanted to make this a larger meal or something that would extend a little further I think you could do it with the uh, with some rice or quinoa but considering the amount that's in there right now I think this is going to be plenty for me this is just a lunch two eggs and all of this this should be a good hearty lunch all by itself so what I'm looking for now is just for that to start bubbling I think the heat is starting to reduce anyway just because the charcoal is starting to burn through. I think I'll have to put a bit more charcoal in it when I want to go make my coffee in a few minutes time. But uh, let's see, what I'll do is put the cover on for a minute, see if I can't bring that up to a bubbling state, and then we'll add the eggs. All right, let's have a look and see where we are. Oh yeah, okay, we're bubbling, that looks good. I think I'll just give that a quick stir, make sure nothing's sticking to the bottom. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Quite a bit of liquid there that I could let steam off. You know, it's not necessary for this to be a really dry dish. In fact, yeah, it could have been a little drier than it is now, but I can still form wells, little div divots in there. And that's, uh, that's what I'm looking for. So what's going to happen next? So I have a wooden spoon that I carved. It's not something I use very often, but that's going to be what I use for seeing if I can't put the eggs in there. A little trick I learned, whether or not it's necessary, maybe you're better at it than I am, is I'm going to crack the eggs into a bowl. Well, my bowl being the, what came, the tomato sauce came in. And then uh, put them in. That way I don't risk breaking the eggs. See if I can do that. There's one egg in. Nice. Very nice. Okay. See if I can't get the other one done. I think I may have mentioned before, I'm a really rank amateur cook. Oops, shell. And that's a good sign of an amateur, eh? Shell in the egg. Maybe a little calcium in my diet, but I am going to try and get it out. There we go. That came out. Make a little bit of a well. All right, that's all there is to it. Well, that's not quite all there is to it, but we're getting much closer. So, what's the deal now? All I have to do at this point is cover this up, let the eggs cook for a few minutes. Now, here's the trick with the eggs. The eggs are going to continue to cook in that hot tomato sauce even after you take this off of the heat. So keep an eye on your eggs to see when you think they're not quite done to your liking. What I mean by that is you decide do you like them solid all the way through? Do you want to have them runny as you would with a, uh, like an easy over egg, one that you might do in a fry pan? Do you want them like a pouched egg where they're you know quite still golden in the middle? So whatever you think that is take this off of the heat just before you reach that point because again the tomatoes will continue to cook the eggs from the heat that's that they have in them. So I'll bring it back when I'm getting ready to serve this up. All right let's uh, check this out. Make sure there's no dust in there. So uh, sounds like I'm making my excuses now and maybe I am. I had to take a second to put on some more black fly repellent and uh, so <laughs> hopefully I didn't overcook the eggs. Oh, I don't know that you can. That looks amazing. Let's see if I can bring it up a little closer. Do you know one thing you could have added to this, or I could have added to it, is cheese. There's no reason. Some of the traditional things would be feta cheese. Cilantro could go on top right now. Um, you know, here we have more ready access to things like cheddar cheese. So why not? A little bit of cheddar cheese on top of that, melt it in. That would be just marvelous. So, how am I going to do this? Oh yeah. Well, the eggs are a little cooked more than I would have liked it, but uh, not, not too bad. So, I failed to say something quite important. Well, it's not critical. It's not like it's going to make or break the dish altogether. But one thing that I could have done and could have said to you was, the last thing you do before you put your eggs in 
is taste test the mixture, the tomatoes, green peppers, onions, red peppers, garlic mixture. Taste it to see if it's spiced to your liking because it's a lot harder to spice it after you put the eggs in. Now I could throw a little spice on top of it right now, but it's not going to mix through. Okay, so that's a single serving there. What I'm going to do is reposition the camera and we'll have a taste test. Mmm, okay. I'm going to see if I can tilt the camera down to show you what I've got. That's showing up? Not quite, is it? Here we go. Okay, so the pouched egg, the tomatoes, green peppers, red peppers, onions and garlic all mixed together. My egg may be a little bit more done than I would have liked it, but uh, looks pretty good to me. All right, now for the taste test. I'm glad I didn't add any more spice. I was a little concerned it wasn't going to be spicy enough. This has got heat. The sweetness of the tomatoes stewed with those other vegetables. A little bit of pungency from the garlic. Flavor of the onion. Oh. Oh, man. I'm lucky I might get a few black flies in here for protein. All right, let's check the egg out. Ah, golden. It came out golden. It left it a little longer than I would have liked it, but uh, nothing wrong with golden. Mmm. How easy is that? I don't have any bread or rice or quinoa to serve with it, but this is a good-sized meal. I still have another portion the same size as this to go through. How simple. It's not, certainly not an ultra light meal. It's not something that you can pack and and uh, have a couple of days on the trail. This is pretty much a same day meal. Eggs and uh, don't keep all that well over time. But for a day out like this, or if the ability to keep things cold for a couple of days, car camping would be easy. It's just on the border. I think what I might have liked is a little bit of black pepper. I didn't put any salt in. More pine needles. Um, I didn't put any salt in. Maybe could have used a little bit of salt. But that's the nice thing about making this yourself as opposed to something that comes in a package. You're in control of what it tastes like. You can add or take out whatever, or add or not add, I guess, whatever vegetables or spices you want in this. It's just such a simple dish. Basically, tomatoes or eggs, uh, what do you call that? Stewed in the tomatoes. Wonderful dish. Okay. I can't stop eating. So what I'm going to do <laughs> is turn the camera off. And I've got some water heating for coffee. And I'm going to make coffee just a little different today. I'll bring you back when it's time for coffee. Okay, my water's on to heat for coffee, but uh, I thought I'd just show you a couple of things. It's only going to take a few minutes for the water to heat, and it's only going to take you a minute to show you what I wanted to show you. Uh, two things. Um, I did say earlier on in the video that I had kind of laid out stuff that either I made myself, or I'd modified myself, or I'd picked up secondhand at, at uh, the thrift store, uh, or I had repurposed things from another other reason that, than they originally were made for. Um, so, what else did I bring? Well, you may have seen this before. It's not carried often, mostly because I have one out for testing. This is my first and only homemade knife. So I made this from scratch, starting with an axe file that had long since lost its uh, sharpness. And I had made a forge, and I, I had uh, annealed it, I had shaped it, and I then uh, heat treated it and tempered it. So it is a made from an axe file. It's just a very simple little knife. It has an extremely nice edge on it. The handle is kind of unique. It is made with homemade micarta in the center, sandwiched over the, the uh, 
length of the handle and then pinned on and I'm using maple on the sides. It is a full tang knife, although it's not a full broad tang. You can see the end of the knife sticking out through the handle. So it just makes up for me a near perfect neck knife. And I'm carrying it in a little sheath that was repurposed from another knife. And it's small enough and light enough that I barely notice it. And when I want it out of the way, such as when I'm moving through the woods, I can stick it inside of my shirt like that. All right, so that's one of the two things. The other one is the backpack I chose to come out with today. So I have uh, a couple of good backpacks, not including the Osprey I showed in a recent video and the Matilda, but I have a few others, a nice Kieferu backpack that was gifted to me. But I have a number of old uh, fixed external frame backpacks, things that were uh, secondhand, uh, picked up at the thrift store for the most part. And I've been playing with them because I like the concept of an external frame backpack. I believe not only can you carry more weight and distribute it better, for the most part, that is, but I think it's also more comfortable in the sense that there's more airflow on my back, uh, around the back of the frame, as long as you've got something that's kind of mesh against your back. So this was an attempt that I had, and it's made, of made out of three different packs, or three different components altogether, and uh, I call it my Franken-pack. So to start with, I guess, is the frame, and I'll turn it around. So the frame is off of an old, very old, inexpensive, I'm not even sure what the brand name was, backpack. One of those aluminum frames, they had a, a, a blue nylon exterior on it. I'm not even sure, maybe world famous or some, some base like that. But the aluminum frame was what I was after, not the pack. The pack itself was just sun damaged, was just coming apart by the by the threads. I think I paid five dollars for the whole pack and frame. I wanted the frame because what I did, as you can probably tell, is I cut the top off. There was probably another eight or ten inches on top of this and the pack would have rode to the top of that. And uh, I wanted to cut the frame shorter and then fit another pack on it so this would set at the base of my neck or right at the top of my shoulder so it wouldn't extend any higher. The backpack itself is something else I scavenged out of Value Village. And I think it was meant for bicycling. It, it was in its day probably a good quality mount, mountain hardware backpack. It's a heavy rubberized material, uh, fairly narrow. It doesn't have a lot of capacity. I'm going to estimate it in the 30 liter capacity. Uh, pretty much simple straight down inside, allowing me to pack things in all the way down. I didn't even take the straps off of it. I'm using the original straps and waist belt to hold it onto this frame. Just a, a way of uh, trying it out. And eventually, if I want to do it more permanently, then I'll find another way to affix it to the frame. But it's working okay so far. The shoulder and harness were off of a very old Kelty backpack, probably one of the very first ones that they used some type of a wraparound waist belt, and I'll show you that in a second. But what I found is that it, uh, the, qual well, the quality wasn't there. It's very old, very, very stiff, uh, not, not easy to adjust, and I had to create extensions. I don't know if I can show you. Let's see. Extensions right here using a nylon belt to get a little bit more length before the padding came down over my shoulders. Otherwise, it seemed to stop right in the middle of my shoulder uh, area. I needed it to come down a little lower. The waist belt is a full waist belt down at the bottom, but <laughs> minimal, minimal padding just enough across my lumbar area. And do you know what's interesting? Despite the fact that I have some good backpacks that are well cushioned, well designed, contoured to fit my hips and everything else, this is probably just as comfortable. I think it distributes the weight well. I had about as much equipment as this as I had in my Osprey the last time I was out. This rides a little higher on my hips. It rides so well on my hips that I can put my hands underneath the shoulder straps at most points and get a little bit of looseness there. That's ideal because that means very little if any of the weight is actually on my shoulders. It's all on my hips. So what did this cost me total? $10. Just a little bit of time finding and scavenging the thing and taking some time to put it together. Uh, like I said, I have a couple of others that are probably in better shape than this and a little bit more complete in terms of what they, what they are. And I'll probably play with those and get those out over the summer as well. But I wanted to bring this out today to stay with that theme of homemade DIY um, repurposed items. All right, let's make some coffee. All right, coffee today is going to be made a little differently than I have before, at least in recent history. What I decided to bring is not secondhand or DIY. It is my Stanley Cook and Brew set. And I think it's only appeared maybe in one other video. 
but uh, uh, you know it's not something I use a lot because it makes a good quantity of coffee. I can probably make three eight ounce cups in here quite easily. Actually that is the capacity is three eight ounce cups but uh, I'm going to make a two well a little large. I'm going to make two cups of coffee today. So I have 500 mils, two cups of wa water in here brought to a boil. And I'm just taking it off and it'll, by the time I finish talking, it'll have dropped to a temperature just ideal. So this is a French press style coffee maker, which means I'm going to put all the coffee in the water. I am going to give it a little bit of a stir. And then you give it about four minutes of extraction time. So four minutes contact with the water, and then you plunger all the grounds to the bottom. And if you haven't seen this one before in my other video, which I'll link to uh, if you're interested at the end of this video, this is the plunger. So it's different than a plunger in most French press. It still has the same stainless steel mesh on the bottom. And of course, this is going to plunger down inside. The value of a plunger like this is not only does it do a good job of pushing all the coffee to the bottom, but in effect, once this goes in, I've created double walled thermos for the coffee, so it's going to stay warmer longer. So coffee today, as it has been a lot lately, is the Rampage Coffee. Still enjoying this. And I think I've mentioned what I've come down to is I used two types of Rampage Coffee blended together, the Riot and their Code Black, to give me what I figure is pretty much an ideal. Now I can go a little darker and enjoy it. My wife likes it a little lighter, so we compromise on something just in between. So French press coffee is ground a little coarser than it would be for a filter. Hopefully you can see that. That's so, of course, you don't get the grounds floating through the filter and into your cup. So it'll probably be about the same as a percolator or as uh, even cowboy coffee. So I'll put all that coffee in. So what have I got? I have, what did I say, two cups of water. So I have 30 grams of coffee that I ground this morning and weighed out. And I'm going to give that a stir in. Uh, the smell is good. The smell is great, in fact. And that's going to sit for four minutes. By the way, just a quick tip. This is the spoon I just ate that shakshuka dinner with. A wooden spoon. It has been coated with uh, flaxseed oil and dried on. But here's a trick. If you're going to be using tomatoes or cooking with tomatoes, wooden spoons may not be your best choice. Because now it didn't happen to the other spoon, maybe because I have more coatings on it. But uh, you can see it stained the spoon a little bit. So, uh, yeah. Not going to hurt the performance of it at all, but it is going to discolor it a little bit. So I'll put that on just for a minute to retain a little bit of warmth. That's the lid before I push it down. By the way, one thing I, I found today, I was going to drink out of this. This is one of the two cups that comes with the Adventure, or the Stanley Adventure, what do they call that? Just a, the Stanley Adventure Cook Kit. It's a smaller one. And this one, they come with two of these green cups. Uh, they're not a bad little cup. I mean, they're very plain. <laughs> They're marked inside for 500 mils you want to use them that way. They also fit down inside of this just nicely. I only carry one. I don't need two cups unless of course I was going to have somebody else with me. Um, so I could have used that today but I will be using my Kuxa, my Kapilka, the larger one, the 10 ounce Kapilka to drink out of. Oh, another minute or two and uh, probably what I'll do, I'll just break for a second rather than wait the full four minutes and then I'll bring it back and uh, plunge the coffee. All right, it's been about four minutes. Let's see what we have. Take the lid off. Looks pretty good inside. Throw the dust off the plunger. Put the plunger in. And it's just that simple. Oh, yeah. Too hot? No, that's cold. Good. There we go. Nice hot cup of coffee, and of course this this thermos well is turned into a thermos now that I've put the plunger down inside. So there's enough for a refill or most of a refill of my coffee. And uh, ooh, it definitely smells good. Time for a taste test. So, you know, I do like using the French press every once in a while. The coffee is slightly different than it is with the AeroPress or with Cowboy Coffee or a pour over or uh, what's the other little one that I use, the Mocha Pot. It's a little bit different. What I like about it is it seems to have more body, like there's some substance to it. You can almost feel 
the coffee. Maybe there's a little bit of coffee floating around that gives it that substance. It's mellowed the taste a little bit from my Aero, my AeroPress. My AeroPress can make a really strong cup of coffee, more like an espresso. And uh, same thing for that little mocha pot. It's, it's near, near espresso strength. So for, if you're not a fan of espresso or really, really strong coffees, then, you know, a French press is a great way to make coffee. And you can usually make more than one cup at a time. I can make two cups with AeroPress. It just involves making one cup that you have to dilute down. That's basically what you're doing. The results with a French press are dependent on a couple of things. One is, well, always the coffee. The quality of the coffee is number one. Number two, the grind size. You don't want the grind size too small or, uh, because, it, of course, it'll come through the filter. And then it's contact time or extraction time, the, t the amount of time that the coffee's in the water. Four minutes is a guide. If you take it off a little sooner and plunger it and then and pour it off a little sooner, coffee's still going to be good. It's just not going to be as strong and as full body. If you wait longer, you're going to get a more full body t flavored coffee, but most people would say that it starts to work towards bitterness because it's been in contact with the water too long. It all depends on how you like your coffee, I guess. It's true most French presses are a little awkward to carry in the woods, especially the glass ones. Of course, I wouldn't carry a glass one. I do have a GSI plexiglass one that we use car camping, which uh, actually I actually have a second one that I picked up at Value Village Surprise. And maybe I'll bring that out sometime. But what's nice about the one that I have here, the Adventure, uh, Stanley Adventure Cook and Brew, is that I can heat the water right in it. And if I wanted, to, you know, if I wasn't interested in making coffee, I could use that water for... Uh, well, it's big enough to put one of those boiling bag types of things inside of it or hot water and I can make a soup right in that, clean it out, then get it ready for coffee afterwards. Oh, this is nice, you know, having this and having a little extra. I don't have to have it very quickly and then I'm finished. I can sit back and enjoy it a little longer. I don't know if you can see behind me the water. It's quite rough. Okay, it doesn't look so rough right now, but a minute ago the wind was just racing down the lake and the white caps out there where you know I, I you'd never be able to fish certainly not fly fish with the wind as it is on the lake right now but uh, if I get down to the edge of the lake I may not be able to record but I should have fewer flies in my face like I have right now okay let's wrap this video up I hope you enjoyed watching me make shakshuka here in the woods I hope that you enjoyed it enough that you may be interested in trying it yourself Maybe you've made it before and you have some tips you'd like to give me because, like I said, I'm, I'm not a professional cook by any means. If you haven't tried it and you do try it, why don't you send me a note along to say that you tried it and what you thought of it. It's just a different way of cooking, you know, cooking eggs as a lunch meal or even as a supper meal. It's kind of a different, certainly different from my experience, but I know a lot of the world enjoys it and I'm certainly learning to enjoy it as well. If you have any comments about that DIY backpack or the DIY knife that I have or about the coffee I made, you can put those all in the comments section below. So it'll be probably a few more days before I get to come back out. If you have any comments, any questions you want to ask me, please put them in the comments section. But until I see you again, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.